Uh, hello. Martin Luther King proposed six principles of nonviolence. Uh, you can find these in his first book, which is called Stride Toward Freedom. And uh, that was published in 1958. Uh, the book is Dr. King's account of the Montgomery bus boycott. And um, uh, the principles of nonviolence were put in a chapter that's right in the middle of the book. Um, here's Stride Toward Freedom. It's a book I'm always recommending that people get and read. And uh, right in the middle of the book, chapter, chapter six is called Pilgrimage to Nonviolence. And the chapter is in two parts. The first part is kind of a uh, an autobiographical history of Dr. King's education, and he discusses the influences on him that helped to shape who he was uh, at the time of the boycott. And then the second part of the chapter presents these six principles of nonviolence. In this video, I'll talk about the first principle, and um, it is, uh, it's about courage. Uh, Dr. King <clears throat> said that uh, nonviolence is not a method for cowards. He phrased it negatively. But uh, uh, nowadays in the world of nonviolence education, when we talk about this principle, it's usually in more positive terms. Um, uh, I would say that uh, nonviolence is it requires courage. Uh, the, the King Center in Atlanta uh, says that uh, nonviolence is for courageous people. So uh, courage is the key idea. And um, uh, let's, um, let's take a look at what might have been meant by that in Dr. King's time. Uh, I imagine him being surrounded by followers. Uh, in Montgomery, who were not used to thinking of nonviolence in quite the way that he intended. So they were always asking questions about it. And I'm sure that some of them uh, asked him about nonviolence. Isn't that for cowards? Uh, aren't nonviolent people the people who hang back and just let things happen? And um, Dr. King said, no, that's, that's not what he meant. Uh, he uh, had a view of nonviolence that's more like the courage it takes to stand up against your group when everybody in your group wants to uh, uh, go in a certain direction or spend money in a certain way, and you don't think it's right. You have a different opinion. Well... Uh, it takes courage to stand up and say that. Uh, you, um, you run the risk, perhaps this is a fear that you have, you run the risk of being seen as a traitor to your own group if you voice a different opinion. But sometimes those different opinions are the, are the right ones. And uh, <clears throat> to stand up and say what you think is right often takes courage. Uh, it's easier to practice nonviolence and to have the courage to do some of these uncomfortable things. Uh, first of all, if you can do it with your friends, in Montgomery, the bus boycott was supported by <clears throat> thousands of people in the black community of that city. And that made it easier to stay off the buses and to walk with uh, friends to get to work or uh, uh, organize carpools and so on. It wasn't something that an individual had to do alone. And that's uh, one of the things that makes uh, nonviolence a little easier in these uh, situations that require courage. <clears throat> um, nonviolence is also easier when you have a plan. And uh, when you know that standing up for what you think is right is part of a plan to change things. And then, of course, it's easier 
if that plan includes a goal. And uh, the the initial goal of the Montgomery bus boycott uh, wasn't to end segregation on the buses. It was just to be uh, uh, granted a little more freedom. And uh, uh, the Supreme Court eventually, after about a year, came down and said, segregated bus systems are unconstitutional. You should be able to sit wherever you like on the bus. And um, so that went even further than the original intentions of uh, the people on, who organized the boycott. In the field of psychology, we've studied some things that are very, uh, very closely related to this kind of courage. Uh, there are many studies of conformity to group pressure and to peer pressure, for example. And I might just say that peer pressure operates just as powerfully for adults as it does for kids. Um, when the phrase peer pressure is used, we're often expressing concern that kids will not think for themselves. But the same concern can be expressed uh, for people of any age, because we, we sort of need our group affiliations, and they fulfill needs for us. And once we are in a group, it takes, uh, uh, it takes a lot to break away from the group opinion, the group consensus. Uh, an extreme form of that human, um, you know, group dynamics is found in what is called groupthink. And uh, this is where a group of people like the board of a company or the president's cabinet uh, in the United States or another country, when a group is responsible for making really important decisions and they sort of uh, keep their decision-making process secret and don't allow outside input that might be relevant to the decision they have to make, when that group itself is consists of people who are all very similar to each other. Uh, for example, uh, President Kennedy's cabinet, at the time they were make, making a decision to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs, it consisted of all uh, uh, senior officials who had gone to Ivy League schools and who were all white and uh, uh, made a lot of assumptions about other people thinking the same way they did. And then within the group, of course, everyone is uh, sort of competing with each other to impress the president and uh, posturing for one another to suggest that their idea is <clears throat> better and stronger and uh, more daring than that of other people around the table. In that situation, groups can make terrible decisions. They make worse decisions than an individual probably would if they were acting all by themselves. And the, the dangerous kind of self-congratulatory thinking that goes on in groups that are too homogeneous, too similar uh, in their makeup, that's a very strong argument for diversity and for bringing in new voices and people with different backgrounds and perspectives, because then you potentially broaden the range of options that you consider and the range of values that are considered important and are brought up for discussion. Um, so uh, there's, starting with Irving Janus at Yale University, there's been a lot of research on groupthink. And uh, it's, it's one of the most important topics in the more larger field of group dynamics. Uh, I think it relates to courage because if individuals are lacking in courage, um, groups go off the rails very easily. Now, uh, just like it's easier to do difficult things if you have friends and allies, uh, group think can be broken 
And uh, some of its bad effects can be mitigated if there are dissenters within the group. If uh, someone in President Kennedy's cabinet had had the courage to stand up and strongly argue that they were headed for disaster at the Bay of Pigs for reasons that should have been known to them, uh, then that bad decision might have been avoided. But um, uh, we can look for research in psychology and thinking in psychology that very much supports what Martin Luther King is saying uh, are important ingredients for a nonviolent approach. Um, another thing I'll mention, I could mention many uh, topics in psychology and other fields that relate to principle one uh, that inform our understanding of courage and how to develop it. But I'll, I'll mention just one more, and that is bullying. Uh, what a bully is doing uh, very often is deliberately disrespecting a victim, knowing that most of the time the victim will be flustered, fearful, um, may run away, or there may be some uh, reaction that the bully uh, sees and that does something for the bully <clears throat> that uh, perhaps restores a little bit of sense of pride and effectiveness or um, what Bandura called it, self-efficacy in the bully. The bully presses our buttons um, and insults us and disrespects us. And that doesn't say anything about us, but it says a lot about the bully. It uh, says that the bully has a need to boost uh, his or her own um, self-respect. And if you know that, if you know that that's where bullying comes from, it enables you to prepare. It enable, enables you to know how to respond in a way that's not so defensive and that's not so fearful because you know where it's coming from. Um, I think that's relevant to Dr. King's approach uh, as well because the civil rights movement took place in a time and in a culture where the African-American community was being bullied all the time. Uh, in Montgomery, the, the problem was not just segregation on the buses, uh, dictating where people had to sit on the bus, but it was also in the disrespectful behavior of bus drivers toward the uh, riders. And um, by protesting against the segregation on the bus system. They were also taking a planful uh, social approach to dealing with an injustice. That took courage. And it's a wonderful historical example of using the factors that make courage easier uh, and using a knowledge of human nature to have strategic responses to injustice. So um, there's more that could be said about all of Dr. King's principles. I'm gonna stop here uh, just for the sake of saving some time. Uh, the next video will be on uh, Dr. King's principle two, and then there will be uh, a series of videos until we get to uh, number six. So thank you for listening. If you found this informative, uh, please subscribe to the channel, give the video a like, and um, the channel is new. You can help to build it up. If you, if you think this is a valuable thing to be doing, please support it. Thank you.